My intention today is to basically talk to you about approved document B, which is uh, on fire, um, with specific relation to flat roofs. Um, this topic has become very much in the forefront after the tragedy at Grenfell, and the government felt that there was some changes needed to the approved document B. So I'm going to uh, save you hopefully the reading of 200 odd pages in each of the uh, documents uh, to highlight the areas that are of interest for flat roofing. So uh, first of all, I should highlight that uh, I'm talking specifically uh, about or make most of my reference to volume two um, and it, the, the English uh, version. Um, <clears throat> so as we can see here is the fact that there is a volume one which is dwellings and volume two is buildings and other dwellings and this was updated uh, late last year. Um, the document itself is split into these different sections B1 uh, to 5 and then some specific parts about regulation and that part there 72 is what is commonly known as the ban and I'm going to take you through the relevance of those to flat roofing. So first of all, at B1, um, B1 really references flat roofs if they're used um, as a fire escape. So it's treated as a floor. And here, the main uh, requirements of the designer come from the inside, um, not from the outside. So from a roofing specialist point of view, we tend not to get so involved in that. Of course, we would be able to guide on um, walkways, etc., on the escape route. B2 is to do with um, ceiling. So again, inside uh, the building, um, there is one scenario where we get involved, which is perhaps when it is that there's no ceiling and the deck it, soffit is the ceiling. The other area we get involved in is with roof lights, which uh, we commonly do. Uh, and of course, they often become the uh, soffit um, to the seat uh, instead of the ceiling. We then move on to uh, B3, which is uh, all about load bearing elements of structure. And here it's important to point out that uh, a roof is excluded as element of structure unless it's classed as a floor. So why might a roof be classed as a floor? Um, common places could be a car park deck, uh, a podium, a, a ter roof terrace and the like. They could all be areas where it might be classed as a floor. But otherwise, um, the uh, other part of B3 is an area that is commonly uh, misunderstood and misinterpreted to the extent that MHCLG at the minute are currently uh, looking to redraft it, not changing its meaning, but making it clearer. And basically, this is the area where you have a roof uh, flying over the top of a compartment wall. So the first challenge is to know that you have a compartment wall there to start with in existing buildings. The next point is, if the deck's non-combustible, then a roofing system of B roof T4, which I'll talk about later, um, is totally acceptable. But if it's a timber deck, then as long as it's less than 15 meters and then a purpose group of a residential office or um, uh, assembly and recreation, then um, B roof T4 is also fine. And B roof T4 could include combustible insulation. And that's the area that's commonly misunderstood. Um, the alternative to that is to build a wall all the way through the, uh, the roof deck. Then I come on to B4, which is the area that most roofing consultants are uh, most familiar with. This is the area that deals with the external uh, fire spread on a building. And the description in B4 is given here where it's talking about resisting spread from uh, one building to another and across the building itself. Um, then I move quickly on to Regulation 7, which I said earlier on, is, this is the, uh, the ban. And here um, it sort of gives with one hand and takes with another. And 7.2, it indicates that materials in an external wall or a specified attachment need to be non-combustible or A1 or A2. But it then does importantly exclude any part of a roof if that part is in connection with an external wall. There is an exception there if it's a very steep roof uh, above 70 degrees, um, um, that that is a wall. 
Um, and also excluded are membranes, all sorts of membranes, including waterproofing membranes, and also thermal break materials. And I'll show some pictures soon to just demonstrate what I mean about that in a roof. We then had what a relevant building is defined. And uh, also we had um, the fact that this was on buildings above 18 meters, although um, that's likely to change to 11 meters, certainly in Scotland it already is. As far as the regulation two, it defines a bit more closely about the external wall. So it's indicating anything located uh, in the wall. Um, and I've said any part of a roof pitched at greater than 70 degrees. Um, but also we have this new term specified attachment. And this um, is principally for our purposes here, referring to a, a balcony attached to a wall. And I'll need to explain a bit later on uh, the definition of a balcony. Um, one of the features of the ban that came in that had never had to be considered before was what the actual reaction to fire of the individual materials of the roof. From a roofing point of view, we always look at it from a system point of view. And certainly uh, Dame Hackett uh, talked very much about systems and not individual products. And so um, here we have one of the unintended consequences, perhaps, and the fact that you'll notice here, I've just put a few typical materials here that are typically used in flat roofing. Um, and you'll see that virtually all materials that you use for flat roofing are classed in E, which you could say is the worst case. Now that's always been the case. Um, and yet um, flat roofs have a very good track record generally in terms of uh, fire in the longevity of the life of the building. But you can see at the top there, the non-combustible materials. So it's an important point. So I now would like just to talk about a few of the other in unintended consequences, the questions that keep coming up time and time again. Um, and the first one is to do with um, uh, membranes. In Regulation 7, um, it talks about membranes um, used for part of the external wall construction above the ground level should achieve a minimum class of B, S3, D0. So we have uh, often people coming on to me saying, yes, I know that uh, roofs are exempt, but we have this requirement here that says that it must achieve a minimum class of B. But you'll note there is no mention whatsoever in that clause about specified attachments. So um, having checked this with MHCLG, that is uh, on purpose. And therefore, it does mean that membranes can be used on balconies. There is another point, which is a, a secondary point, that there aren't actually materials available suitable for flat roof waterproofing that achieve anywhere near B. Uh, you might hear of membranes that achieve B or better, but they will not be suitable for this type of waterproofing. So a membrane can be used on a balcony. Now it's usually covered with uh, non-combustible paving and the like. Another area that caused great consternation was the fact that all flat roofs need to be dressed to a wall. So in other words, you dress them up typically 150 millimeters up the wall. And the purists were interpreting uh, the previous definition as the ban against uh, a wall. So you couldn't take the waterproofing up the wall. And so I wrote to um, Charles at MHCLG, and you'll see his response here, where he's quite unequivocal that a roof membrane system can be attached to a wall within reasonable bounds, which we typically take as 150 millimeters, uh, whilst following the normal constraints that are put on flat roofs. Now, I mentioned I would uh, come back to the thermal breaks. An exemption in the regs is also a thermal break. And so the for the purposes of flat roofing, this little bit of vertical insulation, which in this instance is shown in a inverted roof, um, is the thermal break. So you can see there's still insulation going the full height of the wall. This is to stop flanking uh, losses through the outer leaf. Um, just to show that same detail, but in a warm roof where uh, the waterproofing is on top of the insulation, you see again the insulation shown vertically. So this is a nominal bit of insulation that's uh, shown um, at the abutment of the wall. If it is that it's against a habited wall, so where somebody was potentially living or occupying the other side of that wall, um, then it needs to be non-combustible insulation in that uh, thermal break. 
And if it is that you have a common scenario where you want to dress the waterproofing above 150 millimeters with modern materials, that's quite uh, common and easy to do. Um, there is uh, common sense guidance with regard to a parapet wall that you would typically not want to take it higher than 1.1 meters high. But certainly if you were to dress the insulation up the back of that, it would be um, uh, non-combustible insulation. But I would question as to why it is that you'd want to dress the insulation all the way up there when typically insulation is dressed inside the wall, as we saw in the previous diagram. And also is it's a parapet wall, so it doesn't need the insulation for the full height. Um, so it's something to question. But certainly what is questioned now is dressing insulation and waterproofing higher than the 1.1 um, from a point of view of fire. And I should point out that this guidance has been pulled together also with NHBC. It's very important that we have common thought on these points um, to try and clear up some of the misunderstandings. Um, another clarification was needed for balconies. So a common question is when is a balcony a, a terrace or a roof? Um, and also just within the balconies, the different types of balconies. So I think most people thought about the diagram on the left for balconies, but maybe hadn't considered the diagram on the right of inset balconies. Um, and so uh, these are both classed as specified attachments and would be included within the uh, ban. Um, just recently published is a new British standard BS 8579, which covers balconies and terraces. It was much needed because it needed to clarify some of these definitions. And here we have a very useful uh, diagram that shows the different types of balcony and um, terrace, but it also shows some areas where it's specific about the uh, fire performance. So those areas you see, can see marked in orange there, the waterproofing and roof system needs to achieve uh, a B-roof T4 uh, rating uh, as they are typically um, over habited areas and um, are lightly insulated. Now, um, the actual um, design guide gives clarity, which was much needed because as we started to look around, we realized that balconies and terraces weren't particularly well defined. And so the document has greatly helped us here. And you can see that for a balcony, it's seen as outside uh, the curtilage of the building uh, or certainly um, not over any habited area. Whereas the distinction for a terrace is it's over a habited and perhaps heated space. And a terrace, uh, for my purposes here, I'm going to refer to as a roof. Um, so they are treated differently. Um, and you can see in note three there on balconies, it indicates that a, um, a balcony for the purposes here is not a roof. So just for that distinction, that's important in terms of some of the wording in the ban. So now we come on to some of the terminology that people are used to with flat roofing, which um, in the old days, we used to talk about AA, AB, AC. Um, the new um, standard uh, approved document now only refers to um, B roof T4 and C roof, etc. cetera. Um, the highest standard for flat roofing is B roof T4. And to be fair, I think most flat roofing manufacturers only really consider B roof T4. Um, it's not strictly speaking a fail if we don't achieve that, but it's probably looked on by us as um, the target we look to achieve. The reason for that is if you achieve B-Roof T4, it means that it has an unrestricted uh, rating, which basically means the next nearest building can be as close as you like. Uh, as you go down the um, C-Roof, D-Roof, etc., you'll see that the next building needs to be a number of meter meters away, which could be quite limiting uh, to the building owner. And you can see across on the right there, I've just given also some this equivalent terminology for for Scotland. So very important to relate that the fire rating is to do with how far away the next nearest building should be designed. Um, there are some um, tests that have been previously done by European labs that uh, uh, allow a European ruling to be made that if you use these three different buildups here, you don't need to do uh, fire testing. So if you've got uh, ballast uh, stones um, and they're at least 50 mil thick or 80 kilograms, then um, you don't need to do a fire test. Equally, if you've got sand cement screed, min 30, um, or 
probably very commonly used stone and concrete slabs. Note the minimum of 40 mil. There is a tendency for quite a lot of slabs to be out there a lot thinner than that. They would need to be tested, whereas if it's above 40 mil, it doesn't necessarily need to be tested. Um, there's further clarification. Again, uh, NHBC have done a lot on this, and uh, they indicate that if the paving slab is um, at least 40 mil, it has gaps of no more than six millimeters in the main body of the roof, um, and there isn't a large void underneath, then they're happy for that to go forward without further testing. Um, this is typically used on inverted roofs. Um, if it is that you were to put a gravel void, uh, sorry, a gravel fill in the void under the paving, um, then that would be, uh, be uh, satisfactory because of course, it's one of the exclusions in the previous slide where it said it needed to be at least 50 mil. Um, or of course, if it is that you have an actual fire test that has been done with the full build up, then of course that would be acceptable. But part of the ruling there was to stop having to do needless tests where everybody knew what the likely result was going to be. Then we come on to the very popular area of green roofs. Um, there isn't very much guidance uh, about fire on green roofs. Um, there was a DCLG document uh, written within the last 10 years uh, that had a lot of fire testing done on it. And the wisdom that came from that is produced in the green roof organization guidance. And I've paraphrased that into a few uh, sentences here. So the growing medium, um, needs to be a certified growing medium and needs to have a content of um, organic matter uh, of less than 20% and peat free. Um, if it is that the roof is permanently irrigated, then you wouldn't need so much precaution, but many say even with irrigation, what happens if it doesn't work? So um, also you need fire breaks around the uh, perimeters, which need to be a minimum 50 mil of uh, round pebbles or it could be uh, paving 40 mil thick minimum um, and these should be around all perimeters and penetrations and the width of that should be uh, at least 500 mil wide if there's any opening so if the penetration was a opening roof light then the fire break should be at least 500 mil wide and you need one meter fire breaks if you have a larger roof where it's in excess of 40 meters long. And a very important point is if you're going for the more wildflower flower type green roofing, it needs good maintenance um, uh, to prevent the um, thatch that could be a source for fire. So um, my uh, final uh, slide here is just to um, indicate that uh, having said all of that, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that uh, Bowder has uh, extensive fire testing. It's something that's always ongoing. Um, and our uh, most up-to-date listings tend to be in our agreement certificates, but they get updated every three years. So uh, they can be slightly out of uh, Kelter. So it's always worth asking uh, for the fire certificate. Um, now, I would emphasize that there are thousands of permutations of roof buildups and no flat roofing manufacturer will have done anywhere near all of them. But of course, what you'd reasonably expect is we do the most common ones um, and our most uh, common fire buildups. So as you see there, I point out that we actually have done um, most of the testing on our own products. Um, but as I say, we're always updating our fire testing. So um, that's my last slide. I'd just uh, like to thank everybody for attendance. That was a quick whistle stop through. The slides are available if you were to uh, go to uh, this uh, web uh, address. Um, if anybody should wish to send any questions that we can't answer, um, info at bowder.co.uk would be a good place to send it for my attention. Um, and Kevin, I don't know if I've left you any time. Uh, well, we, we, we'll think we've got one minute, one or two minutes. So we'll, okay. we, there, is a, there is a couple of questions come in. So if we can do those, it'd be great. Um, one of the questions says, there are lots of opinions on the interpretation of approved document B, as we know, um, particularly in this area. And what, what is being done to address this? Are they going to leave it as people still interpreting? No, well, I, I, 
Basically, I, I've been very much one of the key people in, in direct dialogue with the government, and they have all along kept saying the industry needs to give guidance on this. The beauty now is that the there is crystallization on a lot of the points that I made that as common understanding. I can make a number of those statements because I know I have NHBC who is saying the same thing and many other organizations. So basically, the National Federation Roofing Contractors, Single Ply Roofing Association, Liquid Roofing Waterproofing Association together are doing a joint document, which we're in draft phase at the minute. We were just waiting for 8579 to be published. Um, and we will come out with these key points. There's probably about five questions we get asked all the time, and we will cover those. I think I've covered most of them in the presentation there. Okay, thank you. And just one more question about insurance. And it says, what's the insurer's position on combustible materials in a flat roof? Yeah. So uh, the insurers, not surprisingly, always want to have no risk at all. And therefore, there is always this pragmatic route in between that. Uh, they seem to have uh, become more reasonable about what uh, uh, build-ups are. They didn't always like the fact that the government had gone for the B-roof T4 um, designation, and they often still ask for the old uh, rating system, uh, which most people are not testing to anymore. But they seem to have uh, settled on what they're happy with. I think the key thing is often to do with what the deck is. If it's a combustible deck, that's probably when they want to have more requirements added. Um, but uh, yeah, they seem to be coming to a common uh, consensus as well. Okay, brilliant. Well, that's the end of the question. So thank you, Nigel, for a really, really interesting and clearly a very current presentation as we all still deal with the, uh, with the outcomes of, of yeah. Grenfell.